so thank no that's uh, no he's disappeared <laughs> that's all right so i don't need to do too much introduction to you guys because you form part of the usual suspect group um we may have others joining us uh later on who knows but uh Peter is, was formerly a customer of mine, uh, now a good friend. Uh, he had a holiday home with Catherine and his wife just down the road here. Some of you have even peered over the fence as we've gone by, and some of you have even been into the garden and helped me. Nigel, for example, oh. and Clive. No, I just <laughs> Thank had you. <laughs> they were un unpaid labour at different points because they happened to be visiting when, uh, when you were coming. Anyway, Peter, thanks for coming along. Um, I know you're slightly apprehensive about what you're going to say, but this is a place where all views are accepted and debated. So I'll take it away and thank you for coming along. Not at all, thanks a lot. Um, I, I, you're right, I did want to make sure I won't offend anyone. I did discuss it with Steve and mention my worry about others' beliefs, but it encouraged me to go ahead and talk on the subject. The subject is God, question mark. <laughs> It is, of course, very much personal to me, and I certainly don't challenge anyone else's beliefs. Um, I, I'm reading from notes. Um, I hope that's okay with everyone. I developed this learning thinking about me um, and thinking about it from various angles, but wanted to explain it better to you um, by elaborating with some details from the internet that I picked up to, for today. I wanna to make sure my thoughts are sort of more ordered. My learning is that I finally acknowledge that I don't believe in God. Any God. And the interesting catalyst for me was actually meeting Steve, who I finally got to know at a local jazz lunch hosted on a farm near where we lived. Great, great introduction. Over the seven years we were there, as Steve said, we became good friends. Steve, Sarah, my wife, Catherine, and I, and still see them occasionally when they're in England, um, and have a spare evening. Our time together has always involved a good dinner, sharing news, I think intelligent conversation, um, and inevitably, apero and wine. And laughter. They're great company. I mention all this because it became fundamental to my learning. I've no wish to embarrass Steve, but getting to know him and chatting about our quite different lives and careers, he's clearly a very decent person. Modest, but done considerable good in the world throughout his life, putting people in many disadvantaged parts of the world and locally to where he's lived above materiality. I believe he possesses a deep lifelong faith. It's personal to him and he's never tried to in any way persuade me in that direction. Although we have on occasion discussed various aspects of religion and belief. But Steve's friendship, sincerity and decency made me think that I need to stop being lazy about thinking about myself. I have nominally been a Christian for 60 plus years, but this is in the sense that I was christened one as a small child. My parents were also not religious in any practicing sense. So my experience of Christianity consisted of the odd Christmas Eve service, more about being a Christmas tr tradition than a religious occasion, a very short period of Sunday school, and school assemblies, lessons from a very odd teacher of RE, um, who also happened to be a vicar. Um, it was an academic subject history rather than religion uh, i did answer the census question from 2001 when it was added in with christianity but i answered automatically i realized was i actually a christian in any real sense it was just a lazy admission that meant nothing it's kind of easier to jog through life with this facet totally in the background Probably the most disrespectful part of this was um, that I was just hedging my bets. It was better not to reject the idea, just in case that the ultimate inevitability of death, I was confronted with 
Oh, it's all true after all. This um, was, if anything, the realization of the ultimate disrespect to the Jesus and God that I had lazily claimed all my life. Um, it was not faith or religion, but it was actually relegating Christianity to a superstition. So I was prompted to go further and consider not just Christianity, but also other world religions. I've never known any personal connection with God, any God, whether a voice, a presence, a warmth, something in my heart. Indeed, I've never really understood the heart reference. Surely it must be about the brain. No other organ makes any sense. The whole issue of mankind with free will and an all-powerful God seems like a contradiction to me. If you believe in God, then I guess you have to believe in Satan in some form. Then it follows there's a heaven and a hell, again, in some form. How can he be born, live a bad life for 60 or 70 years and spend the rest of eternity in some medieval purgatory? Is there some form of learning from and atonement for past sins? Maybe the Indian religion's idea of reincarnation makes sense. It cannot be a coincidence that belief, especially a particular belief, is vastly likely to be the same as your parents, friends, community, etc. So is it just a well-intentioned brainwashing that leads to a particular belief? After Christianity at 46%, the second biggest group in the 2021 census was no religion at all at 38%. Then followed Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Jews, and Buddhists. I think it's reasonable to say the vast majority of these answers reflect the ethnicity of the respondents. But there was also another category, other, that many would consider superstitions rather than religions. I hope that's not the wrong thing to say. Labeled other and including pagan, Wicca, shamanism, etc. There's a famous quote. Superstition is to religion what astrology is to astronomy. The mad daughter of a wise master. Pope John Paul II said it better. Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. I like this because religion has seen so much error and superstition. Earth at the centre of the universe, the unnaturalness of homosexuality, etc., etc., and science, so many absolutes. Nature of gravity, the conflict between astrophysics and quantum mechanics, the nature of the Big Bang, etc. It seems that theoretical physicists are tearing up th theories as fast as they're being written. Go to India or Sri Lanka and see the incredible diversity of religion and the belief in the absolute truth of the particular adherence version. So much of it, of which has been passed on by communities, generation on generation. Even with the commonality and closely related nature and history of the Abrahamic religions, there seems to be more conflict and absolute belief that my one is the truth, the others are false. Then there is recognition of their overlapping nature. Obviously true in the past, but tragically so, so true also today, and tragically because those religious differences still infect current affairs and even coexistence today. Even with, with strains between Catholicism, Protestants, and the Eastern Orthodox churches, or within Islam, the hate and aggression between Sunni and Shia, schism that goes back 14 centuries. Depending on which source you go to, there are 2.5 billion Christians made up of 1.4 billion Catholics, 1 billion Protestants, and 200 million in the Eastern Orthodox churches. 1.8 billion Muslims, Buddhist number over 500 million, and 1.2 billion Hindus. Even with faiths that have similar roots and beliefs, there are differences and between the world religions, there are very fundamental differences, some being completely unreconcilable with others, but nevertheless with huge numbers of believers. My point is, 
they can't all be right, can they? So who is right? Which deeply religious faiths with followings in the hundreds of millions of people are flat wrong? Wars between religions, monkey and elephant gods, burnings at the stake, stonings for unbelievers and apostates. How can a loving God allow this for century after century? How many millions of innocent people have to die? Free will is not all it's cracked up to be. Then I tried turning to science. I've read a bit, read, not necessarily understood. Stephen Hawkins and others tell us the laws of physics can explain the universe without the need for a creator. Science makes God unnecessary. But many say that doesn't mean there isn't one. If there is, a, if there is, did he press the button to start the Big Bang? If God is infinite, how can he exist before the Big Bang, where apparently time itself doesn't exist? Many scientists believe in the existence of intelligent life throughout the universe. There are so many galaxies, star systems, planets, planets where life would be possible, known as the Goldilocks planets. But when you add to that time taken from planet formation, cooling, the emergence of simple life, the development of that into life with consciousness, then the progress towards society, the technological requirements and resources to travel in interstellar different distances. Many believe that even in this vast universe, there's a probable impossibility for humankind to have any contact ever with intelligent alien life. So why would God create it? Is he experimenting with various combinations of beings to produce one that deserves afterlife? On the other hand, if we on this insignificant planet are it, why go through 14 billion years of creation and a possibly limitless but maybe pointless universe for a few thousand years of mankind evolving, progressing, creating, destroying, and ultimately dying out? The people, that is, not the planet. That'll go on. But here's the biggest but, which I'm sure everyone's it's already occurred to all of you. The thing about all this thinking I've mentioned, trying to look at it from all sorts of angles, is that I came to the conclusion that all my thought processes are totally irrelevant anyway. Ultimately, it's about faith. The faith, a faith, just faith. It's called faith for a reason. Nothing can be proved or disproved, and it's particularly difficult to prove a negative. One person, sorry, one person may know God. I certainly don't. Which takes me back to religion being a hedged bet. That's just wrong. Although I think that no faith is actually a faith in itself. When thinking about religion, I am drawn to Buddhism. It's a non-theistic religion where there's no belief in a creator God. Our driver, when we were in Sri Lanka a few years ago, insisted mildly, he is a Buddhist after all, um, that it, Buddhism, is not a religion, but a way of life, a philosophy, a moral discipline. That struck home with me. If you don't feel God but want to live by good moral standards, Buddhism is a positive alternative. I'm left with, did God invent man or did man invent God? Is it a psychological in, instinctive, necess instinctive necessity going back through the earliest humans? Something to do with evolution. In the same way, Darwin, same Darwinian way, most animals instinctively protect their young, pass on their genes through the generations. Many have the instinct for familial groups for protection. There are, of course, exceptions. Does a creator belief also contribute to species prolongation? Does the pattern of increased life expectancy have any relationship to the increasing number of people in a first world democracy relaxing this God instinct? And so answer that census question, no religion. I don't know. Is this all just pretentious justification? So I needed to climb off the fence. My answer right now is that I can live with my non-faith faith. Who knows? 
maybe that's it. Perhaps until it changes. I'm open to the possibility. I'll see the light and experience the presence. But until I don't, I don't. Very religious people have crises of doubt. Very non-religious people get converted. Just for now, I don't believe in God. No proof, no evidence, no deep set belief to confront the apparent huge inconsistencies across religions. So no hedging. I can't disprove God or know the future, so that is me for now. A, a final Stephen Hawking's quote, not really religious. Remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. And yeah. um, that is me. Any comments, questions, thoughts? A couple of minutes quiet, well, just a few seconds of quiet for a moment. <laughs> I'll take all that in. Sure. I, I know I speak for all of us, Peter, um, in thanking you for what is a masterful survey mm -hmm. of all sorts of things leading to where you are now. Um, I feel as if you've all, not stolen my thunder exactly, but sort of led nicely on to my what I'm going to be doing at the end of this year, which is looking exactly at the same issues you've tackled today. Um, it's so much food for thought and it was beautifully presented that I'm so pleased that for once I remembered to click the record button. So this is, <laughs> is captured. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'll leave others to comment first. I'd just like to say, yes, like Stephen, thank you. That was um, masterful and... I, it shows that, you know, you have thought so deeply about so many things that a lot of people who declare greater certainty about not much um, have, have not done, you know, and I, I, I applaud your, um, yeah, the, the, the very amount of yourself that you've put into to trying to work it all out. And uh, interestingly, I mean, uh, others can say what they think, but... Um, you know, when I was young, uh, Stephen and I shared our upbringing, funnily enough, being brother and sister. Um, but, you know, we were brought up within the Christian faith in a very positive way. And there was a lot of certainty. And uh, I think as I've got older, I said it, I, I, um, I'm involved with and help run a life and faith group in our village on a weekly basis. And I, I said yesterday again, you know, I feel the older I get, actually the less I know, the less that I'm sure, because like you have explained, there is so much that's phenomenal about how we are here and, and stuff that it's, it's, you can't explain it very easily in a sentence or even an hour, I think. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And that's all the interesting stuff when it comes to how gas is the ocean yeah, that was awesome, Peter. I um, suppose you could have encompassed everything that I've ever thought in that. And uh, but uh, <clears throat> I decided there. Yeah, I have a faith, and uh, it's, it's so clear what you've said. You, I mean, it was um, worthy of thought for the day. I think I'm ready for <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, you uh, number of things. That, um, sprang to mind i'm not gonna remember them all um one of my friends is a vicar and he always said that when people move into the whatever it is five villages and parishes that he's a vicar of they choose to join the tennis club the golf club the, the pub or the church and he describes the church as a club for them um but um uh, one running all the way through I, something that um i spoke to me a long time ago was um a vicar who said to me he thought it would help my understanding if i separated faith from religion mm -hmm. and listening to what you've been talking about it it sounded this isn't critical it's just observational that um faith and religion was sort of intertwined mm -hmm. and so for me mm -hmm. um I I believe I actually believe um, that the historical fact that someone called Jesus Christ walked the earth, 
I think that um, man then has yeah. bestowed all sorts of things on him and created the religions yeah. based on him. Um, but at heart, he one of his key messages was go and uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself and, you know, look after your neighbour and so on. And that that's always inspired me. And so I find religions absolutely fascinating. But I've always tried to separate the faith from the religion. And I I became a Quaker because it was the simplest possible re religion. And you can be a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, you can be what 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 or, or um an atheist to become a Quaker. And it's all about what you do in the world. Right, but it's still five miles away. Like a Sri Lankan driver and his view of Buddhism too. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd agree with that about Buddhism. I've done a couple of weekend uh, retreats at a Buddhist. Uh, I I call it the monastery. I don't think they call them monasteries. Um, on um, uh, meditation, and yes, they went through their philosophy and their way of life, and it's exactly as he said. I think. A couple of things that crossed my mind was um, you you posed the question. And it's completely right. So many different fundamental religions that are different. They can't all be right. Um, but then the question comes also, can they all be wrong? Or why are, Why is so much of humanity so dedicated and so devoted to something that isn't correct? Now, obviously, they can't all be right because they're mutually exclusive in many cases. Um, but I liked the thought about there may be a reason that a belief in a creator helps the human model somehow. Need to think about that a lot more, but um, I can I can understand that, and, that's, and I could sign up to that. I think. Um, the other thing is that there was a New York Times article about five years ago, um, which actually has been super deceded. But the title was "Science Science Points Increasingly More and More Towards the Existence of God." And the, the rationale behind that article was that originally we thought uh, to sustain life, a planet just had to be a certain distance from the sun so it didn't boil or fry uh, or, or freeze. And there were lots of planets like that. So the probability was there was lots of planets with life on them. And then as uh, science understands what's actually needed to a trigger and sustain life. And, you know, it's so much more nuanced than just um, water and heat. Um, the, the, probability of a planet like Earth existing, they quoted a figure of um, 10 to the minus 20, I think, billions and billions of, of very, very unlikely that a planet like us exists. Ergo, um, somebody must have made Earth to make it special. I just quote that because it's interesting. I don't, I'm not saying it's it's kind of um, true or, or even up to date. Um, but yeah, I, I, for me, my my worldview that we grew up with that Chris has described, I realise now is one spotlight on a on a much bigger picture. And um, the other thing that came to me recently is that a tiny tiny proportion of the human beings that have ever lived believe what we were brought up to believe. A tiny tiny fraction, you know, it's almost negligible the amount of people over all time have that sort of evangelical Baptist Christian outlook. So it's unlikely that we hit the nail right on the head. So then that leaves all sorts of possibilities. And indeed, that's what I want to explore in part in my birth, life and death series um, in the autumn, which I encourage you all to, to sign up to. You'll be hearing about it soon. But Peter, I mean, I just it's just fits very neatly with with my thinking at the moment that you're sitting there saying my conclusion is there is no God. But great that your final thing was. But there might be. Who knows? Because <laughs> nobody actually knows. And uh, we're all kind of fishing around in this soup to see what makes sense. But I really like what you said today. I really like it. Thank you. Um, if I draw two points, one about um, this kind of genetic um, thing about did we invent God because actually it, it furthers us as a species. Um, I actually think you can argue that both ways. Yeah, you can argue that as a presence of or an absence of. Um, and um, 
the other thing about the planets, I, I, I was listening to Brian Cox, the um, not the actor, the uh, astrophysicist at Manchester University, who's also very tied up with CERN. Um, and, you know, he, he said it, very much what you said is that the possibility of any given planet having intelligent life is tiny, tiny, tiny. However, when you multiply it by the numbers of planets that, you know, the billions of galaxies and star systems and planet out there, and even if you take the, the small Goldilocks planets, small number of small, relatively small number of Goldilocks planets, that's still a lot of planets. Therefore, there almost certainly is life out there. That was his view. Um, but our chances of ever meeting it because of what it takes through time to get to intelligent life is non-existent. We will never, in his view, we will never meet another an alien. But that doesn't mean they're not there. Could I just say a couple of things? Is that all right? Um, yeah, free for all here. Mm. You, you mentioned, Steve, um, a spotlight. And I, I'm not sure whether I, I feel as though I probably have used this yeah. metaphor, analogy, or whatever before, even on this forum. I can't remember about the disco ball. Have I talked about disco ball here? Basically, just to say that truth is a very many splendid thing. And a bit like having a spotlight being one tiny fragment of it. I've had this idea that a disco ball which reflects light in or the images in all different directions. It's as if I'm standing this side of it and the little square that's reflecting directly on me, I can perhaps receive from more easily, but right around the other side, something I, I have no concept of. It doesn't kind of resonate with me, but it doesn't mean to say it's not part of the same truth. However, I can't understand that. And whether you think that religion and I take definitely on board that the word religion is very worrying because it sort of has to do with binding, whereas the things that Jesus said and other faiths have are, are supposed to release you somehow. Um, and faith, I think, is is where one hopes that that is more likely to happen. Um, anyway, that's a disco ball that sort of reflects in different ways, different places where you are and. Um, the other thing was just to mention, um, if anybody's interested in seeing or hearing, a, to me, a very energising way of showing what the life in the time of Christ when his uh, followers became his followers might have looked like. Um, have any of you heard of the American television series called The Chosen? It, um, I've been... And my husband, too, we've been quite blown away watching the episodes. Um, it's available. I think you can get it directly online through their Angel Studios channel, but it is also available through Amazon Prime, certainly the first two series. Um, and it introduces the characters as real people. When you you mentioned, Peter, about the, the golden rule thing of do unto others as you, others would you'd have others do to you or whatever. You know, you, we haven't even got to the Sermon on the Mount yet, but it's fascinating to see how the the people, that ragtag of people that became the disciples who really could well not have liked each other much at all because of the different backgrounds they came from, how they, they come together to be people who can achieve more. And I guess if I hope that my faith can do anything, it's, as with your wish, to to help the world be a slightly better place rather than much worse. Anyway, that's a rumble of thoughts as a consequence of what you said. Thank you. Rumble or ramble? <laughs> Both, maybe. So right is fine. Sorry, Clark. No, just looking, Chris. I've just found it. I'll um put it on my watch list and have a look. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, I haven't yet found anybody who's watched it and not been um, interested or impressed. It's just, I don't know. Well, see what you think. Right. 
try to wrap these up after half an hour, which is about now. Um, but this has been so interesting and stimulating. I mean, uh, usually when I prevail upon somebody to turn up here, it's just to turn up and say something they learned just like that, not to deliver a presentation that leaves us with thoughts that are going to last the whole week. But it's all the more powerful because of that. And I don't want to cut it off ahead of time, but I'll just leave one more chance if anybody's bursting to contribute something else. Just we can listen to it again, I guess. I did. I'll circulate the link. Yeah, yeah. Um, it will need to be listened to again. <laughs> and it deserves to be listened to again. Um, so my final quip. Oh, just to let you know that we have the Death Cafe this month. I think it's the 22nd. I can't quite remember. But if you are interested in death mm -hmm. and think we should talk more about it, like I do, then that's a... Um, uh, I think it's a Friday afternoon at two o'clock in, in March, but it's on the website. Um, and my final uh, quip is to send you off with a smile on your face is um, there was a chap who was dying, true story, and he had a vicar visit him to sort of, or the, his friends asked the vicar to come and ease him into the next life. And the vicar, knowing this man's slightly godless life, uh, encouraged him to renounce the devil before it was too late. And his dying gasp, this isn't a true story, by the way. Isn't. His die isn't. His dying gasp was, the vicar, he said, I don't think this is any time to be making enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I wish you all very well. Yeah. And... Uh, just thank you till next month. Have a great day. Thanks, Peter. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.